let's talk about vital signs. Vital signs includes your temperature, respiratory rate, pulse, and blood pressure. Depending on your facility, will also include pulse oximetry and a pain assessment. This is data that is trended throughout the patient experience in multiple clinical practice settings. So we like to look at vital signs in a trending method. So what was it before? What's the baseline? And how does it change related to what's going on? Vital signs are the basis for our nursing judgments and clinical decision making that can tell us where, whether things warrant additional assessment procedures. In general, the average body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius or a 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit at rest. It is our deep body core temperature that's the average. It's a steady temperature that we, that's through a feedback mechanism that's regulated by the hypothalamus of the brain. Um, it balances heat production with heat loss. It varies from routes, whether we're doing axillary or rectal or oral or temporal or, I mean, temporal, you know, just uh, tympanic. The different routes can give us different measurements. Normal temperature is influenced by cycles, so it usually um, peaks in the late afternoon to early evening, so at nighttime it may be a little more elevated than it is in the morning. Ministration cycle for women who are menstruating, it can be higher during those times, during menses. Exercise, of course, increases body temperature, and with age, there's a wider normal variation that occurs with infants and young children due to a less effective heat control mechanisms. They have um, less body fat, so less ways to keep their bodies warm. And in older adults, the temperature is usually lower in other age groups, and they have a more normal body temperature that's closer to 97.2, the oral route. So an oral temperature is pretty accurate. It's the most accurate and most convenient. Um, the oral sublingual site has a rich blood supply from the carotid artery. It quickly responds to changes in the inner core temperature. That's why we like to use the oral temperature the most. Um, that's when you put it, place it under the tongue in that little pocket, a sublingual pocket. And we use normal um, oral temperatures and a resting person can range from um, 90 96.4 to 99.1. However, uh, we don't really like to to write down a 96.4 temperature. Uh, usually your facilities will have like a normal temperature range for you to use. And if it's less than say the normal temperature range of that facility is 97.2, then they want you to try and warm that patient up if it is lower than the normal. Rectal measurements will be a little bit higher like a half to one degree higher in the rectal measurements. We can use an electronic thermometer. Those are your digital ones. They can be um, oral, axillary, and rectal. Rectal probes are usually red, and it usually can take up to 30 seconds to read, depending on the brand. Oral temperatures, we use the posterior sublingual pocket. So learn what that is and where it is. We want the patient to keep their lips closed around the thermometer so it reads correctly. And we do need to wait 15 minutes if a person has just had intake of liquids and at least two minutes if they have just smoked. But however, if you're gonna take other vital signs as well, then we need to wait at least 15 to 30 minutes after smoking before we take their vital signs. Now, whereas the oral temperature is very accurate, and that's the one we're gonna use most frequently, the rectal temperature is a little more accurate. It's the most accurate, but we don't use this one very often. We only use this when we can't use the other practical routes. So rectal temperature is reserved for a very, very, very sick patients that we can't use any other route, um, but it's just not used anymore. So the, the problem with that is that we have, uh, we can cause discomfort, we can accidentally perforate an anus, 
and we don't want to use that. So we make sure we use the rectal thermometers for this specific route. The tympanic membrane route is in the eardrum and it shares the same vascular supply that perfuses the internal carotid artery. The probe tip is in the shape of an otoscope that you would use to look into the ears. You place the probe tip in the ear canal and usually it's a couple seconds for a reading. We want to pull the pin up, the top of the ear, up and back for adults or down and back for a child under three to straighten out the ear canal to get the probe in there. The temporal artery thermometer uses infrared emissions from the temporal artery. It's, we slide it across the forehead and pause at the temporal artery on either side of the forehead. We usually take multiple readings to kind of get the average reading. It takes about six seconds. It's not as accurate as the oral thermometer. Next, we'll move on to taking a pulse. So a pulse is the sensations that you feel, you palpate in different positions of the body, specifically the carotid, the radial, the brachial, the femoral, the dorsalis pedis, and the, dor the posterior tibial pulse, and the dorsalis uh, pedis pulse. So what is a pulse? A pulse is the pressure wave generation from the stroke volume of the heart. It's a good indicator of the condition of the artery. So we take our pads of our fingers, usually the first two or three fingers, to palpate the radial pulse beginning at the thumb area and sliding your fingers down the thumb to the wrist and you'll feel a little indentation right past the wrist bone there and you will be able to feel that in the in the flexor aspect and that will be the strongest pulsation so we're going to feel for a rhythm is it regular does it beat on time every time how many beats does it have in 30 seconds multiply that by two or you can count for a whole minute, minute if you really want to. We're going to see how many times. That's going to be your rate. Okay, your rhythm is regular. Your rate is how many beats per minute that you get. Okay, now is it irregular? You will count for a full minute. And then the force. The force is how much you feel it. If it's 2 plus, that's a normal pulse. Uh, one plus is a weak and thready pulse, very weak, hard to feel in your, under your fingers, very thready, feels very thin under your fingers. Of course, zero is absent, and three plus is full and bounding. It's really strong under your fingers. That's full and bounding. So that would measure your elasticity. So rate, the number, rhythm, is it regular or irregular? And then force, what is the... Um, grading, grading of it. So 2 plus would be your normal rate reading. So interesting fact, the normal resting heart rate according to evidence-based research states that a normal heart rate is from 50 to 95 beats per minute. But traditionally, we still use the rate limits that were established in the 1950s of 60 to 100 beats per minute. So you will see lots of things that say 60 to 100. And it's not wrong, it's just not the most accurate as far as results relating it to evidence-based research and it will take an act of congress to change everybody's traditional rates that they use in their hospital so we've we got to look at our patient and their age and their disease process okay because for example if you have a really strong athlete who has a, a very good cardiovascular health they're a runner their normal resting heart rate 
heart rate may very well be 50 or below. I've seen 30s and 40s. That is their normal resting heart rate for them because their heart is so strong and so good with just regulating that heart rate at such a low rate. And that's okay. We look at the whole person. Any other symptom? No dizziness, no um, you know, palpitations. They're okay. Where heart rate does vary with age, according to their age and gender. Well, like we said, well-trained athletes, um, you know, they have well-developed muscles, and that includes their heart. Now, anything that's greater than 95 or 100 is considered tachycardic, and that would be a too rapid heart rate if they are at rest. If they're doing activity or exercise, that requires a higher heart rate. That would be normal during the heart rate exercise, but at rest, a 95 or above heart rate is tachycardic and not normal. A normal rhythm of a pulse is regular and even. An arrhythmia would mean that the rhythm is irregular. It can be found in children and young adults, a sinus arrhythmia but it doesn't mean anything's wrong. So heart rate varies with the respiratory cycle and speeding up at the peak of inspiration, slowing to normal with expiration, and children and young adults have a varied um, respiratory pattern. If you feel like there is an ir irregularity there, you should listen to the heart sounds for a complete assessment. Now we talked about the strength of the pulse is the force, and that is the heart stroke volume. A weak and thready pulse reflects a decreased stroke volume, so not enough fluid in the body, uh, the, bo the heart's not pumping out a whole lot at a time, so, and you can feel that in the pulse. Now a full bounding pulse denotes an increased stroke volume, like with anxiety, exercise and abnormal conditions so that means that the heart is trying to um, pump out really fast okay it's trying to increase that stroke volume um, with anxiety or exercise because the exercise or heart rate is going up so that stroke volume needs to increase to push that blood through the body where it needs to go while you're exercising but a three plus full bounding pulse is Normal during exercise, not normal at rest. A two plus is considered normal and one plus is the weak and thready. If it's absent on your fingers, you should get a Doppler to listen to see if it actually is absent.